Welcome, members of the Fae Court, to another episode of Phantology. This is Steven, and I have Ben and Josh on the line. And this is a special edition because they're both together. And if you check out our live YouTube video, you'll see that they look very much alike. What's up, guys? Hey. Hey, Steven. And we are kind of breaking the rules of social distancing here, but we figure it's okay because we're twins. So there's a special allowance. If one of you were to get coronavirus, the other would automatically get it, right? That's how it works? Yeah, I think it's passed, you know, just kind of telepathically through twins. Yeah, for sure. And if you're watching the YouTube video, you might see that we have cool AirPods in. They are, in fact, not AirPods. I got scammed on Facebook Marketplace into buying fake AirPods. Oh, no. So, but they they came to our rescue because we did not have any other true wireless headphone that we could share. So, thank you, slummy Facebook Marketplace, slummy fake AirPods. Thank you, Scammer, for saving the day. Phantology thanks you. You know, I took it. I took them to um, the Apple Store because I was so convinced that they were real. And it took them like 20 minutes to figure out that they were fake. So that was kind of a, a consolation prize for me. These are the evils of Apple. Watch out. <laughs> That's my message. Steven is not an Apple fan. <laughs> Neither is Josh. I am, though. That's all right, though. We're not talking about that. We're talking about Dresden Files, Book 4, The Summer Night by Jim Butcher. Before we start, though, if you like our content, check us out on social media at Phantology Books or online at www.phantologybooks.com. We have all of our episodes up on our website as well as all the relevant links that you'd need. Also, if you'd like to chat with us more, join our Discord where you can tell us all the mistakes that we're making. And if you'd really like to support the podcast, check us out on Patreon. We try to put up rapid reaction videos on Patreon so as soon as we finish a book, we tell you what we think unfiltered and we're also putting up corrections slash supplemental episodes online on patreon so we are going to correct all the mistakes that we are about to make in this upcoming episode now on to dresden we are plowing through these books in eager anticipation of books 15 and 16 or is it 16 and 17 i can't remember there's a lot of books this is the fourth one and this in my opinion is where it just continues to start to get better and better uh, this is one of my favorite editions of the Dresden Files, I think. What did you guys think of this book? I will tell you that this book, I started kind of to lose interest in the Dresden Files a little bit. Yeah. So this is my first read through, right? And I got so much whiplash from being so invested in like the vampire court and kind of all the plot lines that were being set up last time. And they were mentioned here, but I felt a lot of whiplash in like, oh, now we're going to change to Fairyland, and I feel like we lost a lot of momentum. There wasn't much talk of Susan besides him being super depressed about her. And so, I don't know. I just, like, you knew that Dresden was going to save the day again, and there wasn't too many... It wasn't exciting enough for me. I don't know. So that's kind of my hot take right off the bat here. So you required more continuity from book to book? Yeah, I figured that it was okay when it was, like, completely kind of distinct from each other like distinct plot lines but the fact that they kind of tried to keep on go- keep the vampire plot line going while changing to the fae plot line it wasn't working for me i can see that a little bit i understand that complaint because at the beginning of the book we're not talking spoilers yet we will let you know when that's happening but at the beginning of the book there is some stuff with the vampire court and then it's mostly the fae are the majority of the rest of the plot so yeah that is a valid complaint I guess I would just say, look, you got to keep on reading these books because eventually he stops introducing new things and really starts to build upon what he's already brought out. He's kind of doing that already here. And so I'm a little disappointed that you had that opinion. But I do think if you continue to read and continue to go further and further, uh, you will see more continuity and and start to really enjoy the way that all of these different courts and, and magical realms are interacting. Listen, I sure hope that's that's the case, but like I figured that by book four I'll be I'll be a little bit more into it. So and I know that's the thing with Dresden, you gotta keep reading, but when when is that like enough? You know? I figure four books is is a you know Yeah, you're but into these it. are four books of short, fast paced books. You know, we're not talking about epic tomes here. We're talking about like maybe a quick you can read it in a weekend. Um, listen to it in a few days you know like so that's kind of where i'm coming from is i think that the three or four dresden books equals one of these other high fantasy books epic fantasy books that we talk about and i think a lot of the joy in dresden files is just kind of the one-off adventures 
and getting into it, enjoying just the ridiculousness of a wizard in Chicago and all of the other magical realms kind of colliding and humanity being completely unaware. That's where it's fun for me. So it might be a little alarming if you're not enjoying those pieces and perhaps you're expecting too much epic fantasy when this is not epic fantasy. This is urban fantasy and it's got a different feel to it. I will say too, though, to Ben's credit, that I feel like a lot of people kind of struggle with books like four, five, and six from Dresden. Like if I'm remembering back on Daniel Green's reviews, that's where he was getting caught. I didn't really, I just kind of kept going book after book, didn't really think about it and just kept reading because I knew I wanted to read all of them. There is a rough patch. I think the general consensus is that that's around books four, five, six. I'm going to keep on reading. You know, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm just saying this book was when I started to doubt the recommendations of all my close friends. Oh, no. So. <laughs> hey, true or false, did you read this book at like 3.0 speed because no. the library loan was running out or something? It was 2.0 speed, and yes, I did do that. Oh, a, a grain of salt there, right? Grain of salt, yeah. It was a speed listen. Yeah, and and that does happen. Like, you can, you're going to speed read books, too, when you, when you just want to get through them. But I will say that this is another book where you get a lot of new characters introduced. And yeah, if Ben wasn't feeling those new characters, then that might be that might be hard. Yeah, the Fey Realms were a little weird for me. I think I was more into the books with the vampires and the coin people. What were those I guys, don't, I don't Josh? Think like the, in, the demon? Yeah, I don't well, think I, I know, not, not yet. They're, they're coming in in future oh, yeah. books. Yeah, those were my favorite books. Yeah, those ones for sure. So I think maybe in the next couple books, you may have one of those to look forward to. Yeah. Ben. So, so look forward to more new characters coming in yeah those are by far my favorite books and and partly because i think that michael you know really shines in those books too although he was completely absent from this book oh yeah those are they're like the fallen angels oh the denarians yeah that's the name i'm trying to come up with i was stuck on the fallen angel people yeah yeah not daenerys targaryen she's not she does not cross over into the dresden files unfortunately although that would be pretty awesome i think the whole world's stuck on daenerys (laughs) <laughs> if there is one author who could cross over something like that i could see jim butcher doing it successfully his first series called the codex Alira, he wrote as i think a bet or a wager of someone that said you can't write a story that crosses over pokemon and the lost roman legion and thus we have the codex Alira, which is a five or six book series that i read several years ago that's awesome well, listen, if there's anybody that can fail at Peace Talks, it is Daenerys. Ooh, yes. Watch watch out for that. We actually did just get a cover release for Battleground while we're talking about uh, the Dresden Files as a whole. So I'm excited for that book. That book's coming out in November. It's like towards the end of the year. So should we move into spoilers for this book? Yeah, so that that's a bit of an overview for the book. Let's talk through the plot of the book. So full spoilers here if you haven't read Summer Night yet and don't want it spoiled, maybe stop listening. So the action starts with Harry, who is in depression because of Susan, and he is socially distancing, as we all should in these days, but he's doing it because he's depressed and doesn't want to deal with anything else. He's looking for a cure, but not having any success at all. What do you guys think of this? Like, Was it believable? Were you into the Susan romance thing, or was it just kind of like, get over yourself, Harry? I think it's believable. I mean, I think that there should have been more to that, Rather than just being depressed in terms of like plot elements, like that's what would happen in the real world. I also found it funny that, like, as he was in this depression, he was just like brushing off assassination attempts like they're nothing. Oh, come at me, you know, like there's an attempt on my life, like last week. Oh, there's another one happening right now. It's all good. As a standard for Terry. So I, I don't remember having too many opinions about his depression with how it relates to Susan, but. I think it was cool how we got introduced to Murphy and a little bit more of her backstory. Yeah, that is a little bit later, but their relationship really starts to grow here. And you get to see Murphy as more of a dynamic character. Before we get into that, though, Harry meets up with Billy the werewolf, who was in the second book, may have been in third, I don't remember. But he kind of pulls him out. There are toads raining down in Chicago because, of course, uh, there's some kind of fey war going on, is all we know, at the beginning. And then the vampire court takes a shot at him. And right away, you have multiple factions pulling on Harry. This is standard for every book. You always have at least two to three different groups, sometimes more, all trying to take out Harry at the same time. Poor guy. I mean, he's really got it rough. And he, it never gets 
too great for him, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, but it's cool that he always has like his little friends that he can rely on. You know, like all of a sudden there's he like knows these random people on the White Council that like has have his back for no apparent reason, but other than they like him, I guess. Well, he's always been a part of the White Council. Well, is it this? You said something like this is the first meeting that the White Council has been adjourned for that he's like a full lizard or something. So it's not like he like has lunch with these guys every day, you know? Well, isn't that thing that he's not a full wizard yet? And so they're there. They're mad at him, first of all, because he got him into a war with the Red Court. Obviously not a good move for a member of the White Council, but he's not a full wizard yet. And in order to earn his full wizardship or risk being cast aside, and if he's cast aside, the Red Court's going to easily take him out. He has to go forth with the favors that Mab one of the fake queens has demanded of him. That's kind of how the plot begins. And so that scene with Mab introducing her was really interesting because she came in and, you know, obviously didn't introduce herself. He figures out who she is. And then she requests him to be, what what, what was his title that she gave him? The emissary or something? Yeah. Champion, emissary, something ambassador if we back up she purchased his debt from his right. fairy godmother right and said that like she's going to require three boons from him like three favors and the first one is this but she, he gets to decide if he takes yeah. anything he says no and she, she's like i think you're going to want to take the deal then boom he's like either going to be like excommunicated as a wizard and face the full wrath of the vampires or help her complete this task isn't it kind of messed up how arbitrary the number of favors required are i mean he he made this debt with his fairy godmother and then mab purchases it and then she just kind of decides oh i need three favors i mean that's always the number of wishes and favors you you have to provide but come on maybe just one favor is enough to cover the debt why is it so big there could be some magical some symbolism behind the number three with favor steven we don't know Well, I'm sure there is, but it just seems unfortunate to Harry that that's how many he's got to do. Because this one, the one favor that is in this book, takes a lot of effort. So two more. That's not looking good. I did did think it was interesting, jumping back into the Wizard Council. This was our first introduction to the gatekeeper guy, right? He was the deciding vote on if Harry was to become a full wizard. And he said, well, has Queen Mab picked her emissary yet and harry said yes she has and then that's when that's when they decided that he was going to if he passed her test that he would be admitted to be a wizard yeah what was your general impression of the white council ben i thought they were kind of fun there's several different personalities there and you get to meet his old his old mentor ebenezer and the merlin and you kind of see what the politics there are they're not there for a super long time but it, I think it's a nice way to introduce them. Yeah, I was most intrigued by the gatekeeper guy. It made it seem like there was uh, some time travel. Like he wasn't sure exactly what time it was. I don't know. Hmm. Could potentially have some, some ability to travel through time. And then wasn't, I feel like the thing that is sparking the this meeting is the fact that Harry's mentor's mentor was killed, right? You're talking about Justin, who Harry killed. No, the vampires killed somebody, assassinated somebody. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you're talking about the Winter Knight, right? No. Who was killed. They no. assassinated a wizard. Oh, yes, that's right. There's an empty seat on the council. Yeah, there's an empty seat, and that's where Harry's going to fill. Yeah, I'm not sure who was killed, but they were blaming it on Harry because it was kind of an escalation of this war that Harry had started. Yeah, so several people have been killed, and we're kind of talking about all of them, I guess, Let's talk about the reason that Mab, what Mab's favor is in the first place. So her, her winter night was killed, right? And she needs retribution and she needs to know what's going on with that. This guy's name is Ronald Rule. Do, do you guys know why that name is significant? No. Tell, no. tell us, Stephen. Yeah. So ever heard of an author named Tolkien? Yeah. I mean, I have heard of that person. Any idea what the two R's in his name stand for? Oh, ooh. I ha- <laughs> is it Ronald Reagan? No, no, not Ronald Reagan. Ronald Rule, the name of the Winter Knight who was killed. So that's just kind of a, a fun little, fun, fun little piece of trivia. Was that a Wikipedia thing, Stephen, or did you just know that? Look, I know a lot of things, so I'm, wow. I can't divulge the source of my knowledge. 
But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I came up with that. And that's the kind of thing that I think Jim Bursha does really well, where he'll just embed these little things, pop culture type things going in. For example, like this fight at Walmart is awesome as well, because you just have the combination of the unknown and the known. And that's what really makes Dresden Files fun for me. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So Mab is the queen of the Winter Court. Her knight was killed. And to just kind of break down what the court is like, there are several tiers to it. There are, well, first of all, there's the Winter Court and the Summer Court, two different opposing factions that basically provide balance in the universe. And they're going to war right now. And that's why there are toads ringing from the, from the sky, for example. So there are the queens who were, which are like the, the queen mothers who we see briefly. Then there are the queens who are, and that's Mab and Titiana, Titiana. And Mab is the winter, Titiana is the summer. And then there are the queens who are yet to come, who are the winter ladies, right? Is that their title? And they're uh, Mav and Aurora. And then you have the knights who are Ronald Rule and Lloyd Slade. Yeah, so that's a lot to keep track of for me. And the way that that was kind of introduced in this book was through uh, the talking skull. What's his name? Bob. Bob. It was very much like a information landslide. Like, like I was listening to it. I was trying to keep up with it. I almost had to like start writing things down. You know, I had to go at 1.5 speed. I almost had to slow down <laughs> the dreaded 1.25 <laughs> speed. I felt like it's, it's tough because whenever Harry doesn't know something. He just goes down and talks to his magic all-knowing skull who's able to illuminate the path for him. Yeah, that was a little disappointing. Kind of seemed like Harry should have known this information already. It seems pretty basic. And his godmother is part of the Fey Court, so shouldn't he already know this? And it's also disappointing because Bob is awesome. And so it's a little unfortunate that he was just relegated to an info dump role in this book. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Just one romance novel and then Bob... Spills his guts that he doesn't have. <laughs> so the action continues here. I guess Harry's been sent on his quest now, and he goes and does some investigation. He goes through a few different channels. One of them is his trusty friend Toot Toot, member of the Fey Court, or not the Fey Court, but he's just a little pixie Fey guy. Toot Toot is summoned by Pizza, of course. Do you like this character? Do you think he's funny? I really like him. Yeah, I thought it was awesome. I thought this was one of the characters I remembered really well from the first book because it like it was the first time that it kind of evolved the magical world in the whole series and it was like introduced by Toot Toot. And so I thought it was a cool like throwback. Yeah, that's the scene I remember most from the first book too is here's this circle with a fairy and pizza is involved. And that's like what I remember from the first Dresden Files book and it's awesome. The Za Lord bring, brings the goods, right? <laughs> Do you like the voice for Toot Toot? I have not listened to any of the audiobooks, but I've heard the voice is kind of funny. I couldn't tell you. All right, we'll have, we'll have to listen to that. Maybe we'll put a recording up on Patreon if we still do that. I think we're trying to avoid copyright <laughs> infringement, but we'll find out some way to, uh, to provide that to you guys. So the, the plot continues, and his next path of investigation is he goes into Undertown, Chicago, and he meets up with the Cheshire Cat type guy, and he goes and investigates Maeve, right? The or is it Aurora? It's it's one of the summer. It's one of the ladies, and this character is completely unhinged. He's not getting a whole lot out of her. The, the path of information that is maybe a little more trustworthy is his previous romance, who just shows up. This is some of Harry's backstory that's kind of coming out. Yeah, and this was a very interesting part of the series for me. This is the first time where you're like, oh man, Susan isn't the only woman in his life. Do we get some more romance for Harry? What was your impression overall? Did you think that this was a trustworthy character? Were you happy that Dresden was starting to let her back into his good graces? What did you guys think? I'm going to save my Elaine comments for the worst of the best. I thought you love all characters named Elaine. <laughs> oh, when they're freaking queens. Heck yeah. All right. All right, so maybe Ben's not a fan of the previous romance. I was okay with it. I mean, yeah, she doesn't... We're unsure how trustworthy she is, which kind of makes for a compelling plot, and she is being manipulated. So I thought it was interesting, and it provides some access into Harry's backstory, which has been sorely needed up to this point. And then this also kind of leads into... I mean, not this directly, but there's also some more backstory with Murphy. And I thought that was really nice. You kind of see Murphy... At a pretty low point, she seems pretty human. And then you also see her on the other side being completely awesome, taking down a giant tree monster in Walmart. Yeah, 
I mean, completely agree with Murphy. I felt like I was really sad that she didn't get more screen time in the in the last book and the third book, and um, was happy that she got more in this book. Although it still seemed like that was only for the first quarter, and then she kind of disappeared again. It seems like the more and more that that Dresden and the Dresden Files are are kind of going down into the Fey land, or like more magical aspects of it, then the human cop becomes less and less important. So she can only make a difference when it's more Chicago related. Yeah, it's like yeah. When they go into the Never Never, not as much. Yeah, Never Never, or like Lower Chicago, or Upper Chicago, or she can only make a difference in Middle Chicago. Apparently, kind of makes sense. That's her jurisdiction. No, I mean, it, it makes sense. It's just like for a character that I feel like is one of the more fleshed out characters of the book, it's it's tough not seeing her more present in it. But I know initially, at least in the first couple of books, you were saying Murphy was kind of a tough character for you because she didn't have enough of a character. She was just kind of one dimensional. So do you think that she's better now or are you still just kind of like, man, Murphy, whatever? Yeah, th- that that whole scene did do a lot to kind of make her more than one dimensional right because you saw that she loved somebody that just passed away and you saw that she is having a really hard time coping with things and having to resort to uh, like a cocktail of drugs and alcohol and so it was a cool character development you only need like a couple of those to make a character interesting you know you only need a couple layers yeah so maybe a little disappointing that it didn't happen sooner but like i'm telling you i feel like the series is starting to pick up steam maybe you don't quite agree yet but the characters are getting better. I think the the plot's getting better and you're seeing more uh, kind of connection from book to book and, and things are really starting to pick up. Speaking of picking up, now Harry is investigating. Uh, he's continuing to investigate. He actually does a super good job of figuring out what's going on here. I mean, he does get betrayed by Elaine who's being coerced and he gets kidnapped at one point or not kidnapped, but but you know captured and and held by the enemy. But he does a really good job for a middling wizard, you know, to, to, to figure out this whole complicated plot that the Fae have devised to kill each other and steal mantles and power. Yeah, I feel like from not knowing who the queens were at the very beginning of the book to suddenly giving the audience the info dump of the century with like three degrees of separation and like knowing all these things and suddenly being able to tell the audience about it because of truth serum or something like that that was kind of a a part part of the book that i was like okay what just happened i did go back and re-listen to it still didn't really understand everything that was happening and just kind of had to move forward with it okay so let's try and go over it and summarize it so the power structure shifts between winter and summer right kind of depending on what time of the year it is it goes back and forth and so they're getting to the tipping point where it's going to go back towards winter right and the summer side is decides to make a sacrifice so that they will just lose to winter and it will all like the power struggle will all be over and winter will kind of forever be in control wait what i thought that summer was going to like mount an attack against winter before their power shifted back right so i actually misspoke earlier because tolkien's named character ronald rule he's actually the summer knight not the winter knight so summer was killed which means that winter maybe now has more power yeah. it is a little complex so winter has more power but summer winter is going to have a lot more power once it turns into winter but summer still is maintaining a little bit of power right now because it's still summer and so they're going to mount an attack before it turns back to winter so that they can kind of hold on to power, right? Yeah, so the power of ba- the power balance is currently in favor of winter. And so the summer court is atta- it wants to attack. They're mounting an attack before midsummer when their power fades. The resolution of what happened here is that Aurora, who's actually the summer lady, was the one who killed the mm-hmm. summer knight and she transferred his mantle onto Lily, who's this kind of random changeling, like a teenager who's trapped between a fae and a human. They have to make a decision between which side they want to embrace. Anyway, she is trying to take that summer mantle and what sacrificed her on the stone table. So the power fades or the, or the power goes to winter, right? Because she's tired of the power balance. And even though she's on summer's side, she's willing to just like let winter have it. And she doesn't want to fight anymore. Is that what's going yeah, on? Yeah, I think that's what's going on is Aurora 
is done with this whole power balance between winter and summer. So it wasn't the full summer court. It was just Aurora wanted it all to be over, right? And so she was willing to sacrifice to give winter the power to completely take over summer. Yeah, so that was convoluted. Our explanation was convoluted. And listeners, if you're listening to this and think we're a bunch of idiots, hop on our Discord and let us know what we did wrong and what actually happened because we might be a little confused. But I think it actually reading it, it would have been more clear. Maybe uh, maybe it'll seed lower than 2.0, <laughs> Ben, perhaps. I'll take that uh, that feedback. But still, you know, I, I typically listen to books at higher speeds and normally don't have a hard time following it. So I feel like most authors are able to. <laughs> this one was, it was confusing. This one was confusing with how it all played out. But at least now we have the structure of the fake courts and going forward, that's going to be important. I thought it was interesting that they had the stone table. I mean, holy Aslan, right? That we, We've got some Narnia references here, so that's kind of fun. And that's like floating above Chicago in this kind of other realm, Chicago over Chicago, I think is what it's called. So things like that, again, that's what I like about the series. Yeah, and I really like the fact that we had the two levels, right? Like the, the lower Chicago and like the that atom bombs were being tested in and and then Upper Chicago, where is like complete fairyland. So I thought like there was a lot of cool aspects to the book, and and I'm impressed that it can do so much with one city, you know, to make it seem interesting. So towards the end, all is revealed. Harry kind of knows what's going on. The gatekeeper actually comes to Harry and says, "Hey, you you did your part. We're willing to let you out of this and let you be a wizard now." But he still turns him down and says, "No, I need to see this to the end." Classic noble Harry. Harry is very much self-sacrificial. And probably one of his biggest character flaws is he's just like too good. He can't let it go. I agree with that. Yeah. And he always has to rush to the defense of anybody that asks. He talks about being old fashioned and always wanting to help the Dan below in distress, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that line is in there at least once per book. Also, that just kind of reminded me, can I just say that we're in book four now. You don't constantly have to re-explain simple things about the magic system. Like, I feel like every, in every book, he kind of goes through and re-explains, um, like, the never-never and how he's really good at certain types of magic, but not other types of magic. It just, it just seems very repetitive at this point. So that's one more criticism I have. So you think maybe this could have been done in a less info dump way? It sounds like there were several info dumps in the book that you struggled with. Well, I think the repetitive info dump of the basic magic system that we're familiar with, you know, like that he uses his staff to um, strengthen his his power and that he only knows Fuego as a spell. And <laughs> also that he always has to rush to the defense of the damsel in distress. distress. Like, like we, we know those things about Harry now. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't have to keep on telling those things about himself. Yeah. I think that they start doing that less in later books. I think in the earlier books, he's still maybe in the mindset or the editor is that somebody might just pick this one off book without reading the ones before. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Want to be able to understand what's going on. Yeah. That starts to cool off. I think in later books. So once again, read the later books, keep on going. Okay. Let's just talk briefly about the, the final battle here. So they meet up. Harry's got his bunch of sidekicks. They confront all the Fae are fighting each other. This is what's been hinted out through the majority of the book. And Eventually, Harry goes in, he arms Toot Toot and his pixies with like wire cutters, steel cable cutters or something. I think box cutters. Wire cutters would be hard to do a lot of damage with. Yeah, well, I mean, they're pixies, so maybe they, they can't be too big. But yeah, yeah, okay. So he gives them some cutters of some kind that are metal. Metal is the important word here. That are iron. I, or iron, iron, right? Iron, iron. Is, the, is of course. That he probably got from Walmart when he was Achilles fighting every, everybody else. Yeah, I probably just picked him up from Walmart. There's a sale and he, and he nabbed some while it was being destroyed. So then the Pixies are the ones who take out Aurora, who is, of course, this scheming summer lady. Yeah, led by Tutu. This whole thing. Yeah. And then Lily, the changeling, becomes the new summer lady, picks up the mantle. Yeah. That's imp- that is an important thing to note going forward, is that these different mantles of the different parts of the Fae Court always have to have someone owning them. They're, they're going to always be picked up and passed along. If that's one takeaway you have in the book, remember that. And that's just do one final summary of the different mantles we have. We have the queen, the queen's past, right? Yeah, the queen mothers. The queen mothers. Then, Stephen, you run through these because you're, you're better at this. 
and then like the queen queens yeah. who are the current queens and then the queens who are going to come who are the ladies and then the knights who are like the champion emissaries who are kind of the ones who can cross the lines and do the dirty deeds that the noble ladies don't want to do yeah it is interesting to see the the knights being introduced and be given start to be given key roles in this book and that was my another scene that i remember from reading this book is seeing two two taking these people out. I loved it. This is why I can't come for Dresden, you know, a little, a little fairy taking out the queen, one of the head fairies, you know, with box cutters and pizza. It's awesome. Yeah, I agree. That scene was probably, was probably the best of the book. So we've been reviewing Harry Potter. We've reviewed the first two. The second uh, review is actually in production right now. So that'll be out for you guys probably in about a week or so. But one of the things that I wish Harry Potter had more as I'm spending the time to do those reviews is I wish there was more of a crossover between the Muggles and the magic. And Harry Dresden does this much better because it's often the Muggle magic, so to speak, that makes the difference at the end of the day. It's Yeah, exactly. It's Harry being willing to be open to whatever it takes to need to get the job done. And that's what allows him to to win, basically. And I think that Harry Potter does that in its own way, but not with bringing in Muggles a lot of time. It's not like Harry pulls on knowledge that he gained from being raised by muggles to really win the day very often. Can we just say that wizards are very like biased against muggles? Like even, even the good ones like the Weasleys think that muggles are all idiots. No, Arthur Weasley loves muggles. No, but (laughs) even Arthur Weasley, it's kind of like a, like a fascination. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a weird, they treat it as like a weird fascination that he has. If you were to go, to another culture and just like think that everything that they did was super interesting and be like way too into it. That would be a little bit weird, right? Yeah. It'd be totally racist. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Should we do the worst of the best here? I, I think we've talked about all the scenes I remember. So. <laughs> all right. Josh is excusing himself. Let's hear your worst of the best. And if you want to hear more Harry Potter takes, watch for Harry Potter and the chamber of secrets review coming out next week sometime, whenever I can finish editing it. Okay. Worst of the best for me was E freaking Lane. I loved it and hated it. I loved it because we absolutely needed to meet her. It's been hinted at and hinted at. We know that whenever a character disappears in a fire that they're probably not dead. And there was some cool symbolism because it, like Elaine disappeared, or not Elaine, Susan disappeared in a fire and ended up not being dead. So, But I thought that, again, Elaine was just relegated to like an info dump person. Like, she came in the scene when he needed her for a plot device. And so that felt really forced to me. It also felt really forced that, like, right when when Dresden talks about Elaine for the first time with, oh, why why can I never remember a freaking name? The police person. Murphy. Murphy. Murphy, man. Come on, dude. (laughs) Okay. This is embarrassing. Right when Dresden brings it up with Murphy, brings Elaine up with Murphy, like, she's all of a sudden waiting back at his house. It's just, like, there's a lot... I loved about it and a lot, that, a lot that I hated about it. Yeah, agreed. That is a little disappointing. And I'm not going to say anything about future books, but knowing what I know about future books, I agree that she is a disappointing character. I don't know that I have a super solid worst of the best, but I did want to mention one really fun moment was when the battle is starting and Harry runs in. His, do you guys remember the line that he shouts when he, when he runs in his battles joint? I remember the scene, and I remember thinking it was funny, but I can't remember the words that were used. Was it as bad as stretch forth thy hand? No, no. I actually liked the line. It was, okay. it was not as bad as stretch forth thy hand, which is a Stormlight thing that we worst of the best did earlier. But the line was, I don't believe in fairies. He runs into the, he runs in and, and he shouts this. Wait, this is a Peter Pan thing, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's pretty awesome. So I, I, I liked it. Yeah, it wasn't a worst of the best. It was like a best of the best because I liked the line. I liked the scene. I don't know that I have a super solid worst of the best. I did also really like the Walmart scene, which I think we mentioned when Murphy takes down. What is that thing? It's like a chlorophene or something. Yeah. Giant plant monster. And she chops it up uh, with a, what did she use? She There's something a, weird. For some reason, I can't come up with the name, but you know, like you, you pull the cord and it, Chain and chainsaw. it uh, roars and the chainsaw. Yeah, chainsaw. So yeah, yeah. So Murphy uses a chainsaw on the chlorophene, cuts it up. Awesome scene. Yeah, I, I don't know. My my worst of the book would have been Elaine and also just kind of the complex plot line that was a little hard to recall, like who was doing what and which one was scheming with which one. And I think that was a lot 
to do with the fact that it was info dumped to the beginning and there wasn't enough buildup in previous books. But now that you know it, there's no excuse for the future books when the fae, fae courts are going to continue to be important. And hopefully the vampires continue to be important too because they just kind of disappeared after he started going after the fairies. Yeah, I will tell you that there is somewhat of a cycle. In fact, I don't know what the, ex- what the exact pattern is, but it's like every so often, like book X plus five or whatever, and this pattern continues. There's a book that's more devoted to the Fae. There are books that are devoted to the vampires. There's books that are devoted to the Denarians, who you have not met yet, Ben. But that's going to continue. So if you're looking for like vampire, vampire, vampire in books, that's not going to happen. So you kind of have to remember a little bit, but they are shorter. So I think it's fine. And they continue to pop up at least a little bit. Okay, gotcha. So as long as I can keep track of this complex pattern, then I should be should be okay with it. You don't have to know the pattern. That's just an extra No, I, thing. I remember you telling me this pattern when I was reading it for the first time, Stephen, and it like blew my mind. I was like, wait. And I went back and looked at all the books. I'm like, yeah, that is that is the case. Do we know then what the, the two books coming up are going to be about? Is there enough extrapolation there? Yeah, you can infer. Okay, okay. Well, don't infer too much because we don't want to spoil those. Cool. All right, we'll see how far we get into Dresden Files and if we're able to uh, get, get to book 15 or 16. I cannot remember which number it is. But Peace Talks comes out in July, so we want to be ready for that. If not, at least Josh and I will read it and give you guys a review as soon as that drops. So thanks, Ben and Josh. Yeah. And hopefully this video turns out and uh, listeners can see your smiling identical faces together. Yeah. And I guess before we end, shout out to our Patreon supporters. We got King of the North and Bridge Boy. Yeah. Thanks for your Patreon support. If you're interested in the content we put out, check us out at Phantology Books on social media. If you want to chat with us more, tell us all of the horrible mistakes we just made in this episode. <laughs> Look for us on Discord. Our Discord invites are on social media or just chat with us. You'll be able to find it if you look around for just a little bit. And we have a website where all of this information is stored. It's www.pentologybooks.com. All right. Thanks, guys. Until next time. Hey, thanks, Stephen. Okay. See you later. <laughs>